punching. As the ball yeah. middle, the top cap. Yeah. Here it comes up. Yeah. Makes it day city two. Pumps one. Pardon me for shouting. <laughs> but that's Pumps just the electric atmosphere and the Bradley Wheel here. This is the ExtraTime.com League of Ireland Voice Notes podcast and it's a European special today as we look back on a mixed night for Irish clubs with Derry City winning and Rovers and Dundalk losing. However, the Lilywhites were much better in defeat than Rovers who now look certain to crash out. We'll hear from McDara Ferris who was at the Hoops 4-0 defeat to Ferenc Farosh and we'll have analysis of Dundalk's 3-1 loss away to KA in Iceland. But first, it is to Derry City's win over Cups. You've Already heard Colin Green's passionate description of Kavanaugh's winner. That was on LOI TV. But now let's get some cold, hard analysis with former Candy Stripes player Gareth McGlynn, who was at the game and afterwards sent us this voice note. Thanks, Oshin. The final score here at the Brandywell is Derry City 2, Cups from Finland 1. And it was two second-half goals that saw Derry City come from behind to stun Finnish side Cups at the Brandywell. It was Will Patching and Cian Kavanagh who both struck to give Rory Higgins side the advantage ahead of next week's second leg in Finland. And I have to say, it was a performance, it was a complete performance from start to finish. Derry City were by far the better team. The Candy Stripes had their chances even in the first half, but they did go behind after Mark Conley was penalised for, it was a handball, he almost went to block the ball, his hands were just in front of his chest, just below his face, and it the, the ball did hit his hands, and in fairness to the referee, he probably got it right. It was Axel Vidovskog who stepped up to send Brian Maher the wrong way from the spot. Cups were eager to get a second, and in fairness to them, they did push on after the penalty and it took an incredible one-handed save from Mar to deny Titi Yangai, whose fierce drive was headed t- straight towards the it was it was the front top corner. Um it was there early in the second half. It was a brilliant one-handed save. Rory Higgins freshened things up uh, by sending on Paul McMullen and the Scott had an immediate impact as his cross was met by a bullet header from Will Patching. Um, the ball found the corner, but I have to say the cross was brilliant, but the, the power that Will Patching was able to generate in the header really took it past the keeper because the keeper did get a one hand to it, but it just it, it almost parried it into the corner. Brilliant header. And so that made it 1-1 despite the best efforts of the keeper. Derry City then roared at the finish side after they almost took the lead straight away after another substitute. Keen Kavanagh but in fairness to the keeper, he did save. And then, not only that, he got up and, and blocked Duffy's follow-up as well. But I have to say, fairness to, to Derry City, um, they refused to let it go and they turned the game on its head completely with a second goal on the 79th minute. It was a quick throw-in, put Duffy in. It was actually Ben Doherty that threw it in, put Duffy in behind and he hooked the ball over the head of two defenders for the onrush and Keane Kavanagh for an emphatic finish to stun the finish side who in fairness they started to, to get at each other after that as well they weren't happy with how it was conceded and let's be and I'll be honest with you after that that was in the 79th minute it was really Derry had a lot of momentum and stayed with them for the remainder of the game and their keeper had another great save again it was McMullen who was running right at the defence he saw the advancement of O'Reilly in the middle of the park he played a beautiful pass in behind the defenders and in fairness to O'Reilly he had a first time shot but the keeper got down really well to to, to save it with his fingertips had that gone in and they, they'd gone to Finland 3-1 up it would have been hard to see the, the, the Finnish team come, come back as it is Derry City go to Finland with a 2-1 victory and they will fancy their chances in the second leg well that was Gareth McGlynn let's now hear from Derry City defender Mark Connolly who spoke to the Drive 105 Match Night Live commentary team I listen a massive win it's a uh, sort of the cliche of the first half um First half done. We've obviously got the second half next week, um, but a brilliant result for the for the football club um, and a special night. Uh, the, the fans were were incredible. The boys were were brilliant. They bounced off that all night, and uh, yeah, massive result. Well, Derry could have been forgiven for uh, being a bit flat coming out in the second half, given the nature of the penalty and, and the goal just right on the stroke of half time. Um, you know, a lot of lesser teams might have folded in the second half. Uh, Derry showed character, resolve, resilience, everything. Come out in the second half and turn it around. Yeah, listen, I think that says a lot about the team and the players. I think we uh, we um, came out second half knowing that we uh, 
we're, we're, we're fully in the game. Listen, first ten minutes you're kind of sussing them out and seeing their movements and, and tactically what way they what they do things. But second half we we kind of uh, we were the we were the better team and we took it to them and, and we got the two goals. Not a sense of disappointment. Maybe that's strong, but is there a sense that? There was a missed opportunity to get three or four because the keeper made some great saves and Derry were presented with some great chances near the end. Yeah, listen, keeper was probably man of the match, so um, that says it all. I think if we had got three or four, it would have been nice. But listen, we're, we're two one up going into the second half, so it's something to be positive about. I was saying to the manager in his interview, Mark, that uh, he was always saying about the strength of the bench and the subs come on and they actually helped turn the game around. Uh, Paul McMullen, especially with that great cross on. Incredible. Listen, Big Kane took his goal. Uh, he probably could add another one as well. But we, Paul, listen, he's a he's a he's a talent. He's a he's a he's a really good player, and uh, he come on and he give us that wee bit of injection we needed in the second half. And um, and yeah, listen, uh, he got us over the line. But I think a special mention for the fans. They were they were incredible tonight. They re- they really second half they they got us over the line. It's, uh, I mean, maybe the fans don't appreciate how much you appreciate them on nights like this and helping you getting over the line in tight games and when situations are adverse. But uh, the managers mentioned it, the other players have mentioned it. Uh, the fans are special on nights like this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, listen, we need them. We need them every week, uh, home and away, especially in the brand new. We need them. We need that atmosphere. We need them sort of giving us as, as much uh, encouragement and, and, and support as they can. And I've and I touched on it before. I know how expensive it is, these European games and the cup games and everything but to be honest with you they've been here every week um, and it was just special for the second half and they are a, a big 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 reason why we why the second half was so so dominant um, but uh, listen it's, the, it's only the first half of that game we, we, we have another extremely tough game next week Looks like uh, Cameron Dummigan's back, back to his best. I mean, he was marking a Finnish international tonight. And, uh, well, I, for me, he was man of the match. I don't know for the players, but he just absolutely dominated him. Listen, Dummigan's a, is a special player. He's a special person. He's a great lad. Um, it's difficult. He, he missed pre-season. He had a bad hamstring injury. He's come back and he's sort of redone his hamstring again. So it's been a really stop-start year for, for Cameron. Um, and it's going to take time. Listen, you can't just, once you're back on the pitch, people will expect you to be back to the levels that, that he's been the last few years. But uh, he was he was especially the last few weeks. I think he's he's been back to his best and um, I'm delighted for him. Finally, the game wasn't over. The tie is still well in the balance. Got over there and uh, they had a couple of players missing for visa issues, but they may start next week. But uh, the manager was saying Derry aren't a defensive unit. They're both the attack, and I'm sure going on the front foot next week will be the message. Oh, absolutely! Listen, we're not we're not going over there to sit off and sit in the edge of the box. We're, we're going to go there and try and play and and then and play the way we play every week. It's going to be an extremely tough game next week, but um, we're going there with a, a goal lead, and, and hopefully, yeah, I'm sure on the break we can catch a few more. This is the Extra Time dot com League of Ireland Voice Notes podcast reaction to Dundalk's defeat in Iceland to come. That was a game in which they could have and probably should have got more out of. First though, let's pick through the wreckage of a bad night for Shamrock Rovers with Magdara Ferris, who was in Hungary to watch their 4-0 defeat against Ferenc Varos. And afterwards, he sent us this voice note. Just like last year, they suffered a heavy defeat at the hands of Ferenc Varos in the first leg of a European tie. But unlike last year, when they knew they already had Europa Conference League group stages in the background, essentially Rovers now look like they're going out of Europe after just four games compared with 14 matches last season. It was another chastening away defeat from home for the Hoops. They haven't won in their last six competitive games and they've lost their last four European matches. It did start well. Liam Burt had come into the starting lineup. He hadn't started a league game for Shamrock Rovers and he came in to start his first European game. He had a good run in the first five minutes, danced through a couple of tackles on the edge of the area and got a shot away. And it looked like Rovers were well set up, but as had happened in previous matches in Europe against the bigger European sides, they started well and then conceded an early goal. And it was a horrendous error by goalkeeper Alan Manis. He had come back into the Rovers side for his first European start of the season, um, but he somehow managed to allow David Seeger's looping, deflected shot off Pico Lopez get by him just under the crossbar. Uh, and really it took the sails out of, of Rovers out, out of that point. They retreated behind the ball, mostly 11 men uh, behind the ball. Johnny Kenny ran the line uh, well up front. He, he did his best, but uh, it was a Rovers found themselves two goals down when Christian Ramirez scored on his first game back for Ferenc Varas after re-signing this week uh, under new manager um, 
the Ecuadorian international took a shot from outside the area, kind of went through traffic and beat Manus to his right. Rovers hung on till half time without conceding another goal, but only two minutes into the second half, um, they went three goals down. Uh, Ramirez's cross from the right was powerfully headed home by Adam Tror- Adama Traore, who'd scored two goals against Rovers in the 4 0 game in Budapest last year as well. Uh, and then they matched that score from that game. Uh, Adam Varga slotted home the fourth after Traore got by Sean Cavanaugh on the right hand side. That was in the 74th minute. And uh, the 80 or so Shamrock Rovers fans in the corner, maybe it were wishing for the final whistle to come quickly. The Rovers did rattle across bar late on. Johnny Kenny was unlucky not to score. Uh, and the other maybe bright, bright point on a very disappointing night for Rovers was 16-year-old Naz Raji making his, um, uh, making his debut for uh, Shamrock Rovers. Uh, but they were 4-0 they were down uh, by that stage when he'd, when he'd come on. It, it leaves uh, Shamrock Rovers in a difficult situation they're essentially out of Europe they're out of the FAI Cup um, so all priorities will be on the league they are four points clear at the top of the table with 11 games to go but will need to find some form if they are to match the four in a row side from, from the 1980s but all in all a difficult night for Shamrock Rovers in Budapest uh, they do face Ferenc Varis in the second leg in Tallis Stadium next uh, Thursday evening they did win that game last year 1 0, and uh, I suppose Stephen Bradley will be looking to pick up his side again that they might do so again to try and get some momentum as they go into the tail end of the, the league campaign. Extra time.com's MacDara Ferris, who watched Shamrock Rovers defeat in Hungary. Dundalk were also defeated, losing 3 1 to KA in Iceland. This is what manager Stephen O'Donnell had to say to the Dundalk media team after the game. Yeah, just a disappointing result. That was all. I thought we were t- totally dominant. Um, obviously frustrated with the goals we gave up on, on counter attacks, but from a performance point of view, I thought it was a, it was a totally dominant performance away from home in Europe. And on another day, we we could have got three or four. We started really well, but they, they were clinical with their, their three they were, finishes. They were efficient, but I don't think we just started really well. We play, played very well. Like we dominated the whole game. Don't know what the possession stats are where we played the game, but it was it was a thoroughly dominant display. Um, and we'd just be disappointed where the build up to the attacks and the pressure we had on the ball originally for that then to, uh, within the space of five or six seconds to be scoring in the other end you know so that's for something for us to focus on um, but from a performance and a composure point of view from the players as I said I thought we, we were we were we were so dominant This is the ExtraTime.com League of Ireland Voice Notes podcast it's a European special and that was Stephen O'Donnell the Dundalk manager speaking to Gavin McLaughlin of the Dundalk FC media team following their 3-1 defeat to KA in Iceland. Aoife Mullen of the ExtraTime.com podcast. You watched the game. Is Stephen O'Donnell correct? Did they deserve more? Did they deserve better? I suppose from my point of view, he's right in, in some respects. Perhaps they, they did deserve more. They created a lot of chances. They had a lot of possession. But the scoreline doesn't lie. And I suppose the three chances that KA had in the first half, there were only three shots on target. They... Stephen O'Donnell said we're, we're efficient. Gavin McLaughlin said they were clinical. So they made their chances count. Dundalk couldn't. And now they find themselves 3-1 down. And I suppose the manager's trying to put a positive spin on it. And rightly so. And that's his job because he's trying to bring his troops back for a game next Thursday and highlight the fact that it is halftime. So effectively, it's halftime in the tie. Away goals don't count, it's, which is unfortunate in this case because we'd like Daniel Kelly's to, to count as an away goal. Um, but as Stephen O'Donnell reiterated, there's still another match to go. And as I said, it's half time in this tie. And we we would hope from a Dundalk point of view that they can make the support in Oriel count. And that is a big deal. The fact that the second leg is in Oriel Park and you've been to many big games there, European nights, domestic nights, the whole lot. How important is it that the Lily White supporters, the Dundalk FC fans make a great atmosphere for their team? It's hugely important, Oshin. I don't think you can underestimate the crowd at Royal Park and what the home support can bring and how they can boost the team and the performance. And we've seen it before, as you've alluded to there many times, there have been fantastic performances in Oriel Park and it's not called Fortress Oriel for nothing, but I think that can really spark performances from from the team 
the togetherness of the town. I suppose every everybody comes together on those European nights and Dundalk have put it up to teams like, you know, Larnaca, Carbeg, who didn't manage to win in, at Oriel Park. So that will definitely give the team confidence. Uh, I've no doubt about that. And also, I predict it would be a sellout. It, it generally is. And the last European game against Bruno's Magpies was a sellout at Oriel Park. And you could definitely feel the atmosphere there. Now, it's a step up from a team from Gibraltar moving up to to this team from Iceland who who showed last night that, you know, despite the fact that they're sixth in the Icelandic league and possibly there are teams of a much higher calibre ahead and, and in this competition, that it's still a step up from, from the previous tie and Dundalk are going to have to be a lot better, a lot more efficient, a lot more clinical. And if they are dominating possession as they did last night, they're just going to have to make sure that they, they take their chances. And it will be great that a team will come to Oriel Park and not win Jabetta synthetic surface because KA do nothing but play on synthetic surfaces. Although, to be fair, Dundalk themselves wouldn't be overly happy with the surface. Stephen O'Donnell said that a couple of months ago. Anyway, I'm uh, I'm messing here. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just before we um, wrap up the podcast, you've been part of the ExtraTime.com World Cup podcast with Donald Ireland have one more game left. No matter what happens, we can't go through. There is a debate as to whether or not Vera Pau, the manager, should mix it up a bit, should give players who haven't got game time a chance against Nigeria, should nearly change the entire 11 so everyone who went can get some game time. My stance is, is that's an important game even though we can't get through. A win at a World Cup would be a big deal. It would be a confidence booster. And I think she needs to play her best team and not experiment. What do you think? How long have we got? <laughs> I think you're right there, Ashton. I think well, from Vera Pau's point of view, or looking at Vera Pau, she tends to stick to it, the same team and she tends not to make huge changes. And I think that's probably why the changes that she did make in the second half in the game against Canada came as a bit of a surprise because, you know, she made that triple substitution and we possibly weren't expecting that at that time. Um, and I remember I spoke to Donal afterwards on the on the podcast, Donal Ryan, and we, we did discuss that and we weren't expecting all of those changes at that time. Now, I see where you're coming from in the fact that this is history making, like the squad have already made history and they've already made the people of Ireland proud. And we've spoken before about on the World Cup podcast about what this means for the future of Irish football and the fact that young children, boys and girls now have these heroes to look up to. I think that for the players maybe who didn't get a chance to play, it would be disappointing that they would make that journey and that they would play the roles that they've played so far in this remarkable journey, that they wouldn't get a chance maybe to to have some sort of performance or, you know, some game time. The Nigeria game, though, based on the result against Australia, which came as a bit of a surprise to some, means that, as you say, it is important. It's important now that we we do try and get a win because I think I would have been optimistic prior to that Australia game against Nigeria, possibly, that we would have been able to get a positive result. And as you say, get a win. And although we can't progress any further, that that would be another positive step and another boost for the team. You don't want to make wholesale changes either and run the risk of of not getting a result and conceding a lot of goals. So it, there's a balance to be found there in that can we continue on even maybe keep as a spine of players there like you know keep Courtney Brosnan maybe keep Katie McCabe experiment a little bit just I suppose that side of me that's thinking the players that maybe should be afforded a a little bit of an opportunity and I'm thinking of maybe Chloe Mustaki is just springing to mind and and all that she's been through and the quality that she brings and then I'm linking that back to um, Greg Slogan her partner obviously playing for Dundalk and then I'm thinking of Danielle Kelly who's obviously a cousin of Abby Larkin and she performed so so well for the 30 minutes that she came on in the, in the first game against Australia um, and just back to Daniel Kelly who actually was the goal scorer last night obviously for Dundalk in Iceland um, and while I'm on that subject possibly could have scored again had two chances very quickly after that but back to I suppose the, the women's team that I see were both sides of the argument really in that it would be it to take this opportunity to give players a chance play on the on the world stage on such a wonderful occasion but at the same time, there's going to be that bit of caution now based on the results thus far, based on the fact that we're sitting with zero points and we would like to ideally get something out of this game and show show the standard that, that, that we're at because there's so many positives to take from both of those performances, as we know, and as we've reflected on numerous times. But to get that win, to give the side confidence and, as you say, to just put a, 
a better gloss um, on the overall appearance, I suppose, and um, end the, the World Cup story on, on a positive note. OK, Aoife Mullen of ExtraTime.com. Thank you very much yourself. And Dolan, no doubt, will be back after the Nigeria game with a bit of analysis, because even though we can't get through, I think it's still a massive game. A couple of massive games coming up for the Irish teams in Europe uh, next week. Big for the coefficients. Uh, the coefficiency, coefficient, is a coefficiency or coefficient? I don't know. Which is it? We go coefficient. Yeah, one. well, it's like the human brain. I know it's massively important, but I have no idea how it works. That said, there are many people who don't know how the human brain works. There are um, many people who don't know how the offside rule works either, as we saw last night. Well, that's very true. That's very true. Uh, okay, Aoife Mullen, thank you very much. Uh, that's it for the ExtraTime.com League of Ireland Voice Notes podcast. If you're listening to this on Friday afternoon or Friday evening, there's three games tonight in the Premier Division. Cork City taking on Shelburne, Bohemians up against UCD. And Drada meet Sligo Rovers in the first division. It's a busy night as well. We've got Athlone and Waterford, Galway against Bray, Kerry against Finn Harps, Wexford taking on Treaty, and tomorrow, tomorrow night, Longford taking on Cove Ramblers. Um, Sean Barron signing for Galway today. That was confirmed. That's a good signing, the former Cove Ramblers player. A very decent uh, keeper. Was at City as a young player. Aoife, you've another point to make. Just as you're listing out the fixtures, maybe just to say that perhaps for the teams in Europe, that's another positive in the fact I'm thinking, obviously, from a Dundalk point of view, I'm looking through lily white tinted glasses. Um, but I'm just thinking that now Dundalk and Stephen O'Donnell have a full week to prepare and to focus on this game so that all of their video analysis, all of their training will be geared towards this game on, on Thursday. So the domestic fixtures taking place tonight, we're looking forward to those um, and hearing feedback on those that it gives the the three teams who are playing in Europe that opportunity to focus the attention, focus the minds and hopefully that would be something else that can work in Dundalk's advantage from my point of view. Yeah, well Dundalk not involved tonight, the same as Derry City and Shamrock Rovers uh, but the teams who are involved you'll be able to keep up with them and follow them on extratime.com this evening and of course across the uh, extratime.com social media platforms including at Extra Time News. You can contact me via at Oshin Langan and by the way a plug for a friend because uh, of course well, that's what this podcast is all about, isn't it? Giving plugs to friends. Tom O'Connor is commentating on Drogheda United against Sligo Rovers tonight. It is live on LOI TV. The commentary from David Sheehan and the Drogheda United uh, commentary team is always excellent, which generally includes Paul Crowley. Don't think he's involved tonight, but uh, generally he is there, there and he's brilliant along with David. But if for whatever reason you can't watch it, if you're in work or in the car and you can only really listen to it, then check out Tom O'Connor on Ocean FM. That's it from the extratime.com League of Ireland Voice Notes podcast. This has been a European special. Uh, we'll be back to normal service in the next couple of days. And of course, Aoife and Donald will, will be back with the uh, extratime.com World Cup podcast following Ireland's uh, game against Nigeria. Let's hope that Vera Powell's team can get a result to finish the tournament on a high. I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.